Good morning and welcome back to the lecture series on partition of India in print media and cinema. So, we are talking about the accounts of the survivor in the context of Jyotir Moi Devi's novel uh, Ipar Ganga Upar Ganga translated uh, to English as uh, the river churning. So, uh, the notion of uh, myth uh, Hindu epics, legends uh, and other non-historical storehouses of collective narratives uh, play uh, a crucial role in the narrative of the river churning. Uh, we see that uh, a mythical framework uh, or the framework of uh, epics primarily uh, Mahabharata and uh, Ramayana uh, and uh, Mahabharata ma mainly uh, actually inform uh, the the way uh, Jyotir Moi Devi is uh, shaping uh, the experience of uh, women's trauma. So uh, Jyotir Moi Devi's uh, understanding and and uh, shaping of women's trauma in uh, her novel is uh, greatly informed uh, by and draws on uh, Hindu epics uh, Mahabharata and Ramayana. Uh, mainly uh, it is influenced uh, by Mahabharata, largely influenced by Mahabharata. So, uh, so this notion of uh, the uh, post-colonial uh, refugee woman uh, being uh, positioned, being located uh, and, and her trauma, her, her silence, uh, question of unspeakability uh, being uh, traced uh, vis-a-vis a -vis, uh, 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 mythical uh, information or uh, a mythical uh, paradigm is, is something uh, that the reader uh, discovers in uh, Jyotir Moi Devi's work. So, there are allusions like I said to uh, the two Hindu epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana uh, and Mahabharata is actually at the center uh, of uh, you know of of the discussions or or Mahabharata's understanding actually uh, explains the protagonist uh, Sutara's uh, pain and uh, suffering throughout the novel. So, um, in the very first page, the novel refers to partitioned India as the truncated Mahabharata. So, uh, India, the modern India, is actually juxtaposed with the great uh, Bharata or the Mahabharata, uh, which is uh, in a way uh, bringing in two uh, temporal uh, spaces uh, together. The, it would be better to say that the mythical uh, uh, landscape of Bharat is overlapped with uh, the uh, modern post-colonial uh, nation that uh, India is. So, uh, talking about uh, India as the great Bharata. Uh, Mahabharata reminds us of a resonance of uh, the epic with the uh, Sanskrit name India. So, her understanding is actually uh, you know facilitated with uh, resources, with a knowledge uh, that is available uh, to, the, uh, to the Hindu communities uh, in the form of uh, the two epics. Uh, so, she, she refers to uh, Delhi as the ancient Hastinapur of the Mahabharata. So, uh, critics uh, and scholars like uh, Pallavi Chakraborty says that the parts of the novel are uh, named after three books. So, Chakraborty, Pallavi Chakraborty uh, rightly uh, notes that uh, the different parts of the novel are named after the three books of the epic. So, uh, in the translated text by Inakshim Chatterjee, uh, the first part is called Adiparva uh, or the beginning, uh, which is after the first book of the epic. So, uh, the, it is after Adiparva, the beginning is after the first book of the epic, uh, the book of the beginning. Uh, and then the second part is called the Anushasan Parva, the imposition, which is uh, after the 13th book, the book of instructions. And the last part in which the, 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 the original title survives is called the Stri Parva. Sri Parva, the women, uh, which takes its name after the 11th book of the epic, which is uh, usually translated as the book of the women. So, allusion to Mahabharata is uh, crucial in the work, uh, 
and and Minakshi Mukherjee feels that the original title that is uh, uh, so this work was originally named uh, not Ipar Ganga Upar Ganga but Itihashe Stri Parva Women's Chapter in History uh, and this original title according to Minakshi Mukherjee would have re would have reflected the starkness of the theme uh, in a better way and uh, it would have highlighted uh, its direct link with the uh, epic Mahabharata. So, we see here I mean very briefly speaking uh, uh, a kind of juxtaposition being made between history uh, the, the idea of history formation uh, which is a, a western idea uh, a kind of recording uh, of, of facts formal objective uh, uh, observation and documentation of facts. Uh, and uh, so, history formal objective uh, recording or and documentation of facts is juxtaposed with uh, Itihasa. Itihasa is an indigenous uh, is, uh, you know its origin is in the terms origin is in uh, Sanskrit and it means Itihasa means uh, thus was a tradition. So, uh, in a way there is uh, a suggestion that women's experience cannot be accommodated and contained by the formal uh, production of or, or formation of historiography. It needs an alternative space uh, in order to record the women's voice or even the lack thereof, the, uh, the lacuna or, or the absence of the women's voice. So, there is a constant reference to um, and, and uh, uh, you know there is a constant uh, connection made between uh, the, the current experience, the contemporary lived uh, you know experience uh, of uh, the protagonist with uh, the, the uh, mythical historical experiences uh, from uh, Mahabharat's women's chapter. So, narrative is uh, full of allusions of Hindu mythic women who were violated in different ways and uh, who never uh, uh, and uh, their, their violence, their suppressed uh, oppressed status were never redressed within an essentially patriarchal understanding of justice. So, uh, critics note protagonist Sutara's uh, uh, name is evocative of uh, Tara. Tara was uh, the queen of uh, Kiskinda and uh, Bali's wife in Ramayana and uh, she was given to Bali's younger brother uh, Sugrib after being widowed and this was a decision taken by uh, Rama. So, uh, we see that uh, Sutara uh, is named after a woman who had two husbands in her life and it was not a choice made by her, it was imposed uh, from above by, by Lord Rama to her. So, and yet, uh, the, the character Tara is actually one of the five, uh, she is considered as one of the five ideal women, the, the Pativratas, uh, uh, who, who has been uh, loyal to her husband and has actually uh, fulfilled her uh, role, uh, you know. Uh, perfectly as a wife. In Hindu mythology, there are several characters with the name of Tara, but the, uh, the most likely source for Sutara's name could be like I said, uh, Bali's uh, queen uh, Tara in Ramayana or it could be in the name of Brihaspati's wife uh, by the same name Tara. So, Brihaspati's wife's name is also Tara and she was abducted and raped by the moon. We see there are different uh, references also made to Draupadi of Mahabharata and also several uh, references made to uh, uh, you know several allusions made to Sita of Ramayana. So, in spite of these women's uh, you know uh, mythical uh, uh, or and, and uh, almost a superhuman uh, status. Uh, despite these women's uh, divine births and suprahuman status, we know that uh, uh, all these uh, mythic women cited in the story by Jyotirmoy Devi, 
uh, I mean, uh, there is a common experience that binds all these uh, mythic women that are being cited by Devi. It is the experience of humiliation, of being wronged and violated. So, uh, compositely they become a prototype of the collective wrong done to the women. Uh, and this is the repository, this is the mythical knowledge of uh, the, the Indic, uh, you know, land taken from another time and space being uh, juxtaposed with the uh, situation, the current situation that the refugee women experience, that the, the, the sufferings that uh, the refugee women go through, their afflictions. So, uh, so Cynthia Leonard comments that although Draupadi uh, as well as Sita is one of the uh, five Pativratas, the fact that she is married to five men puts her in a comparative disadvantage despite the justification given in the Mahabharata for her multiple marriage. So, uh, basically what Leonard says if paraphrased would be that Sita is easily, uh, there is a better justification to understand Sita as uh, pure. The Indians actually uh, understand it is easier uh, to, to depict Sita as pure and uh, although she was uh, uh, abducted by uh, another man and she had to stay in his house, it is uh, I mean easier to resuscitate her uh, you know defiled image and put her back uh, within the frame of the ideal. However, it is more difficult in the case of Draupadi because she uh, uh, I mean she is uh, looked at as already pro uh, a problematic character by virtue of the fact that she has five husbands. So, uh, Draupadi cannot be resurrected to, uh, to that pedestal of the ideal woman. Uh, it is uh, <coughs> I mean uh, uh, a reader has to be, what uh, Leonard says is that the reader has to be more trained in order to uh, read, to, to see uh, Draupadi a pure woman, to see Draupadi as uh, a woman whose reputation is not already tarnished because she has five husbands. So, in Jyotirmoyi Devi's novel, uh, these partition survivors are also struggling with uh, this kind of uh, you know a tarnished reputation, a tarnished image and so these survivors uh, after many of uh, I mean after many of them endure rape and rejection, uh, it is very difficult just like uh, Draupadi is very difficult for them to assert their uh, bodily purity or the dignity uh, of their character. So, uh, Devali Mukherjee Leonard says that Jyotirmoy Devi situates Tara within the nation, woman as nation paradigm, but in her writings the fallen woman is a symbolic uh, representation of the nation. And so, Sutara's experience, Sutara's uh, Sutara's uh, position is actually explained well in terms uh, of the woman's uh, ordeal uh, from ancient Bharatvars. I mean that is where uh, she is actually located uh, or I mean her, her experience is transposed to the experience of the ordeals of the women from ancient Bharatvarsha. Uh, in uh, at one part in the novel, uh, patriarch Amulla Babu sees uh, Sutara's uh, face and uh, I mean compares Sutara to the bloodied symbol of the pain of the mother figure we call our country. So, uh, recurrently there is this, uh, uh, this uh, image of Sita, I mean the, the, uh, the pure woman that is, uh, that is misunderstood. Or, or that is blamed uh, wrongly, which uh, uh, you know, which uh, is drawn on, or which is referred to uh, uh, explain uh, the position of Sutara. So, uh, so Sutara becomes the pained motherland, the the motherland asundered. Uh, <coughs> she is the symbol of the pain uh, of the motherland, and uh, so the 
Mukherjee Leonard would go on to say that the text does not simply call her as a symbol of the bloodied motherland, however, uh, instead uh, that she is the bloodied symbol points to recognition of the gendered embodiment of the symbol, to the violence of that embodiment and to the critique of this process. So, that is what uh, that is how Leonard understands uh, Sutara's representation as defiled motherland. So, the question of uh, women's independence comes up in terms of uh, paid labor and of the financial independence of women of a certain class, uh, but it runs into a broader context of liberation itself. So, uh, we could uh, look into uh, Virginia Woolf's a room, of one, uh, a room of One's Own. It would be a reference point to understand uh, the case of Sutara. Uh, so, the echo of Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own uh, is present in the novel, in uh, Jyotirmoy Devi's novel. So, Sutara's financial independence and yet her exile uh, from her community rings against the question of a broader political freedom and yet uh, the lack of this freedom, the limitations of this freedom within the uh, wider context of patriarchy and uh, patriarchal schemings. So, <coughs> a critic like Shubhuranjan Dashgupta would say that uh, Ipar Ganga, Upar Ganga is indispensable for the present moment, uh, like other classics on partition uh, and he is referring to plays and films by Riti Ghatok, uh, novels of Amrit Pritam and Bhisham Sahani and short stories uh, by Rajinder Singh Bedi, Sadat Hasan Manto and uh, he is actually uh, placing uh, Devi's uh, novel within this opus. Uh, some of these most important uh, or seminal works on partition, which prompt us to recall the past and provoke us to uh, link uh, the past with our turbulent present. So, uh, Das Gupta would say that as we reflect over what we read, we realize that the adamant virus is still within us. Based on the we the opposition, the psyche of partition still stalks and assaults. Um, in our fight against this enemy within us, Jyotirmoy Devi is an unerring guide. So, uh, there could be a certain uh, critical, uh, I mean uh, the novel could actually be uh, read or, or revisited uh, through a certain critical perspective, where uh, Jyotirmoy Devi is actually treating Sutara as a stock figure of the refugee working woman and she is uh, in a way of uh, depicting Sutara as the pained motherland, the asunder motherland, uh, she is uh, reifying the gendered roles uh, that, that have been uh, celebrated and timelessly glorified and that uh, form a major subtext in the, uh, in the, in the nationalist uh, discourse in the mainstream nationalist discourse, where uh, we see we have already talked about the position of the uh, females uh, in, in the Congress, in the Indian National Congress and uh, how uh, they would uh, play uh, uh, an inspirational rather than a substantive role. Uh, they would, so if the men, the Swadeshis would go to the prisons, they, they would uh, be, I mean when upon their return, upon the Swadeshis return from the prisons, the, um, uh, the INC women would uh, welcome them back and perform certain rituals that had Hindu colorings uh, in them. So, so with, uh, with an arti, with, with, with a lamp, with a, a, a wick and, and incense sticks, they would welcome the, the prisoner, the Swadeshi back. And, and so, the, the gendered uh, you know division or, or uh, the, the, the gendered roles and, and uh, women's position within this uh, discourse of patriotism w was, uh, I mean it was defined and it was uh, limited uh, to, uh, I mean to, to and it actually echoed her uh, roles within the domesticity. And we see that uh, Jyotirmoy Devi is not really critiquing that. 
So, throughout uh, the novel, uh, Sutara is an emancipated woman. She uh, actually earns uh, her education uh, and she goes on to become a lecturer and yet there is a vacuum in her life uh, uh, which uh, has its and this uh, lacuna or this uh, pathos has its origin uh, in, in uh, a, a kind of uh, it is it's a bourgeois lamentation, a lamentation that has, that has its origin in bourgeois ideals. So, because her life became a kind of uh, wayward or, or a distraction from uh, the imagined ideal, is uh, there a kind of uh, uh, trauma or, or a kind of uh, underlying pain uh, informing the entire narrative, which she cannot, uh, I mean, which she cannot overcome. It is only overcome in the end with uh, her marriage with uh, Pramod after her you know the, it, it is overcome in the end after she is engaged with Pramod in a way Pramod proposes her marriage and so we understand that she can actually uh, re-own she can reclaim her membership within the bourgeois dam and, and or the bourgeois uh, cosmos and that actually tends to take away the pain. It is reactionary in a way if we read the story if we read the narrative from this point of view. So, uh, so uh, subjected to the same conditions of sexual abuse as in the case of innumerable refugee women of partition, uh, one can understand that caste and class identities of a woman can uh, actually create different uh, you know um, different uh, registers of, of uh, you know re different registers of uh, of uh, survival experience. So, so uh, they can make one woman irremediably, uh, it can make one woman irremediably a uh, prey whereas uh, another uh, a victim uh, turned into an agent. So, uh, Suthara belongs to, she is inherently from an upper class Bhadra social standing and there is a complicity we understand. Uh, uh, between the class and caste in a Bhadra society, uh, which uh, further worsens um, a woman's experience as a pariah uh, refugee girl. So, when uh, uh, an upper caste, upper class woman is violated, uh, much more is at stake. Uh, the Dalit woman is always already demonized and in the common parlance, in the, in the patriarchal uh, way of speaking. Uh, or, or uh, according to the uh, you know uh, the, the the vocabulary that the patriarchal society supplies us uh, the the dalit woman is actually uh, responsible for uh, for the molestation or the uh, violations she undergoes so much more is at stake and uh, uh, so the experience for the upper caste upper class woman becomes entirely different uh, when once she is violated or she is survivor of any kind of sexual uh, violation or violence. So, uh, the question that remains is that would a non Bhadra Mahila need to struggle so much with the ideal of righteousness if placed in the same situation as Sudhara Datta, uh, underscoring only the gender and the sexuality of the molested uh, woman reduces her to being just a body which cannot be differentiated from other molested female bodies. So, her gendered experience needs to be underpinned with her uh, class caste coordinates. So, uh, as a riot inflicted and presumably raped woman, the narrator makes Sutara's gendered body reclaim its uh, bhadra or respectable status through obeying the strictures of middle class upper caste Hinduness. We see her performing penance in a way travelling to Haridwar and uh, taking uh, a holy bath uh, and, and that is and after this incident uh, comes the chapter where Pramod actually proposes her. So, it is a kind of uh, purgation, it is a kind of uh, uh, self denial also, it is a kind of denial or, or, uh, or a kind of uh, self deprivation that uh, Suthara is inflicting on herself also, maybe she sees herself as a, a deviant from the bourgeois ideals. 
uh, we never get to know however, because there is uh, a kind of uh, I mean the, the language is absent. The, uh, the, the, the person that has experienced uh, the violence never speaks up in the no, uh, narrative. So, Sutara's silence about, about the rape could also be seen uh, as uh, positing her uh, you know as uh, positing her producing her as a conformist middle class woman and uh, in turn qualifies her attributes uh, uh, I mean as uh, her attributes uh, actually qualify as that of an authentic Bhadra Mohila. So, uh, so produces her as a conformist uh, middle class woman and qualifies her attributes uh, as that of uh, um, an authentic Bhadra Mahila, thereby acting as the novel's uh, chief ingredient. So, Sutara's uh, genteel and docile character uh, almost taking, taking after Sita's uh, ideal uh, you know qualities become the chief ingredient that identifies uh, that, that, that uh, I mean that uh, positions this novel within uh, you know the opus, the 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 classics uh, produced on Bengal partition. It actually resonates. Sutara's figure as the violated refugee woman resonates, and her behavior henceforth resonates with the mainstream Bengal partition memory, or even the partition memory. So so, and maybe the marriage or or the reentry into bourgeoisdom that uh, she she. Uh, gets in turn is the reward for 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 her docility for her uh, submissive character. So the narrator's uh, emphasis on the Sutara the victim's uh, abjected image, uh, abject image, vi Sutara the victim's abject image, based on the assumption that she is sexually violated, which is never mentioned in the novel by the way, uh, facilitates the novel's admittance within the canonical literary corpus canonical literary corpus of Bengal partition. So, Sutara's rape is not fully considered unless we also uh, locate her within the specific caste class uh, matrices of identity, especially because she comes from an upper echelon of the Hindu community. Uh, uh, and her way of reacting to this rape cannot be fully understood. I mean, we would call it rape within courts because we never know. Uh, once again and uh, this experience of uh, rape as uh, uh, I mean as it is given to understand in the rest of the novel cannot be fully grasped unless it is explored against, against uh, the entire range of her sense of belonging. So, there is this possibility uh, like uh, Marxian uh, critics say uh, that uh, the bourgeois female it is very difficult for uh, a bourgeois female to identify and relate and establish a sisterly alliance with the uh, with her uh, Dalit counterpart. Uh, so, uh, had uh, Sutara not been a riot victim, uh, she could have uh, very well re enacted the hegemonic casteist, casteist relations, she could have very well enact re enacted the hegemonic uh, casteist relations uh, like her female kin. Uh, in in Calcutta. So, so her relegation and subsequent reconciliation with these patriarchal norms or, or the values that make up the, the bourgeois society, this entire space of uh, you know uh, th this uh, class caste space of uh, the, the bourgeoisie, uh, her, her relegation and reconciliation with the patriarchal norms of bourgeoisie cannot be equated, cannot be equated uh, with that of a Dalit or a minority female victim's experience. So, because a Dalit woman is uh, always, uh, she she is always uh, you know doubly marginalized once by uh, the 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 male kin within uh, or her male counterpart uh, in her own community and then with respect to the refined class people uh, uh, of the nation. Uh, so, for a Dalit woman there is uh, hardly any chance of uh, the question of uh, for a Dalit woman the question of deviation and the chances of social elevation does not even arise. 
So, uh, we have already talked about this Nainika Mukherjee talking about the sentiment of sorrow being built differently around the male and the female. So, the pain of the father or the brother of the raped woman is it, it emphasizes uh, as part of the nationalist commemoration of the war whereas, the female loss is actually uh, understood in relational terms. So, she is a sorrowful widow, mother or sister. So, one never knows that Sutara is indeed raped. What if she is actually not raped? Uh, does her magnitude of trouble become any less? Uh, so, this is uh, I mean this way of reading the novel would uh, invite other ways of uh, uh, alternative ways of looking at Sutara's loss which is not uh, less in any sense. So, so uh, which is not uh, you know which cannot be underestimated in any case. So, she is orphaned by this riots, the, these riots. She is rejected by her natal family, if not on the grounds of sexual impurity, uh, then because she has spent some time with in a, in a Muslim neighbor's household and then her homestead is burnt down. So, uh, one could, why it, it is a, a, a kind of problematic that uh, one needs to engage with. Uh, where w one never uh, you know associates a woman's loss uh, in terms of the property. So, uh, her, as her father's homestead is burned down, it could also mean that in the absence of her father who has been murdered, she along with her male siblings also incurs the responsibility of refurbishing the caste class prestige that is associated with her family name. So, the, the burden of uh, reaccumulating social and uh, uh, you know economic capital that have been raised by partition. And uh, so, Sutara is not only embalming her wounded femininity, it is in important to understand that she is uh, a woman like her many a times uh, positioned in her, situ uh, in her circumstances, her situation is also grappling to rebuild on her middle class upper caste facilities. Uh, which have been taken away by the partition in the first place. So, uh, delimiting Sutara's refugee, exper uh, refugee experience to her uh, gender in a way ignores her uh, caste position and we understand that uh, by doing so, we ascribe uh, I mean uh, castes as uh, you know a male phenomenon. So, so it we understand that caste is a male formulation and a woman is an extension of the male's identity. A woman does not, uh, a woman cannot even own her own class and caste. She has only her gender to own and narrate. So, uh, this approach uh, of only looking at Sutara in terms of a gender reserves the class and caste based agency only for the males uh, such that. Uh, the, the likelihood of caste and class based setbacks can only be associated with the masculine notion of defeat, uh, defeat loss and nostalgia. So, uh, although reflecting comprehensively on the gendered possibilities of Sutara's silence, where uh, in the silence, I mean for a trauma survivor we have already talked how silence, uh, ha I mean silence uh, manifests uh, through, through repetitions, slippages and uh, sometimes a lack of articulation and, and this is something that we study in the case of Sutara. In the case of Sutara, however, there is uh, a kind of uh, a, a, de a deafening silence, uh, but the critics are not touching on her class and caste identities, uh, both of which make uh, an important reverential agreement to her Bhadra belonging. So, uh, as there is an ambiguous chapter in this, I mean as they read this silence in the ambiguous chapter of riot through imposing in a way the interpretation of rape, there is no scope of treating Sutara outside of the gender violation. So, we look at I mean when we talk about the situation in Sutara's village in Nohakhali at the time of uh, riot one would see that there is a class caste situation. Uh, the class and caste based uh, divisions in Sutara's native village uh, is actually mentioned in the novel at the beginning and these discrepancies take up an extreme uh, uh, form and, and they pick up along communal lines uh, during partition. So, 
So, what is understood as the peaceable and the normal picture uh, of the village is actually a perpetual condition of socio-economic exploitation by the upper caste Hindus, uh, uh, you know, on the peasantry. Uh, so, uh, so we see that Jyotir Moi Devi exp explains the village population mainly comprising Muslims from the village population as mainly comprising Muslim farmers, weavers and labourers, most of them uh, and, and a large section of Hindu Namasudras who, who earn their living as boatmen and fishermen and the Hindus are relatively more affluent. So, inequality is naturalized and it is instituted as a divine Odin uh, and that is the uh, classic picture of uh, you know a pristine and idyllic village. So, so inherent in this uh, ideal is the uh, you know the the suggestion or the possibility of a class caste revolt. So, uh, we see that uh, the Dattas were first molested by the their Muslim workers, the Muslim peasants came and violated the family. So, and and however, Sutara was rescued by an upper class Muslim neighbor, which offers a second standpoint of class harmony between the upper uh, you know between the wealthy Hindus and the wealthy Muslims outside of the uh, you know outside of their religious identity. So, we can read uh, bes that besides class, the fact that caste practices had worsened rural relations is understood from the fact that the, the fire first broke out uh, in the Brahmin locality. So, it uh, actually suggests that there was an inherent dislike among the subalterns towards the Bhadralok Hindus. So, so we s there are certain difficult zones in Jyotirmoy Devi's uh, version of feminism and uh, radicalism if we may. So, uh, so it strengthens reifies, reinforces new patriarchy, it exemplifies an elite egalitarian and powerful facet of this new patriarchy. And Sutara actually, Sutara's character sustains itself in a well thought out balance between uh, certain bargains and certain compromises that she makes. So, uh, although Jyotir Moi Devi is criticizing Mahabharat, she is also describing female angst in terms of patriarchal social divisions. So, uh, Sutara's suffering becomes a sequel of the mythical Hindu women's humiliation and this knowledge like I have been trying to put uh, towards the beginning of this lecture today, this knowledge of uh, Hindu women's uh, humiliation uh, is something that uh, the Dalit woman, the Muslim raped woman uh, cannot uh, understand because Mahabharat as a text or as a ready oral myth or religious discourse is not available to this uh, these sections of the Indian society. With this, I would like to stop today's lecture. Thank you.